Well, hello. Uh, here we are again, another Wednesday, and we're in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Uh, I'm Mitch Ewan, your host, and our sponsor is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. So the forum uh, looks at is always looking for good policy to help uh, move the goalposts forward uh, for Hawaii's clean energy sector. I'm really delighted to have Ben Sullivan, the uh, energy coordinator for the county of uh, Kauai on the line. We're, <clears throat> we're doing this long distance through the uh, technical expertise of our technical staff, which is great. And uh, we're going to talk about the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum Peer Exchange, which is a brand new initiative uh, we've started this year. And uh, this is actually the first of the uh, peer exchanges um, spot or led by uh, uh, ben, and he'll be reporting out and telling us all about what is a peer exchange anyway and what their results were from their first uh, peer exchange. We're, we're hoping that this is a new initiative that really helps to broaden uh, the uh, field of input to uh, the forum and also output to the citizens of uh, Hawaii so we can make informed, good energy policy. So welcome, Ben. And Ben, very thanks, Mitch. It's great. To... Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's great to see you there on the beach. Ah, that submarine was just about ready to dive on me. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the beach is for my Canadian buddies. I always have to get a plug in for Canada here. Eat your heart out. It's getting to the cold time up there soon. So, uh, first of all, I have a, a, a first question for you, Ben. Uh, what is a peer exchange? You know, what is that concept? Before we get into the sure. results. So, I imagine a lot of your listeners are familiar, but um, from my perspective, a peer exchange is really uh, something within a network organization that is member driven that allows members to get together on an ad hoc basis to talk about a particular issue that is emerging or of a particular relevance to them and to try to work through how they might address that issue. So what it could really be something very specific, like some piece of legislation or a project, um, or it could be more of a planning concept like it is in this, in this case. But it's a day or two where you, where you work intensely with your peers and you think about a given issue and you focus in on it and you try to deliver some results. And, and you know, it's really um, a unique opportunity. So often we spend an hour on the phone here or 10 minutes you know, in a, you know, t an hour in a meeting here, 10 minutes on the phone there, and we're all so busy that we don't really get to dive deep on an issue. A peer exchange is that opportunity. So you go somewhere outside of your office, hopefully, where you're free of distractions and you get all the, the small group of folks that you really think can help you focus on the issue and you dive in. So is it done in person or is it a combination of people, uh, say, going to Kauai and uh, all piling into a room and uh, brain, basically a brainstorming exercise. How, how, did, how did this uh, peer exchange, what are the mechanics of it? So, sure, sure. The mechanics of this peer exchange were, um, it was actually set up on the shoulder of the Hawaii Congress of Planning Officials. And we did that uh, deliberately so that all the folks that were coming over for the, for the peer exchange could, could also take advantage of the fact that the Congress of Planning Officials was happening the next two days in Maui. So we went to Kanapali um, and we got a space in a hotel and we spent the day in there. And we started off with breakfast and we, we worked through some kind of baseline setting on the on the issue, which we'll talk about shortly. And, um, you know, got everyone familiar, familiar with each other. In this case, the peer exchange involved uh, trying to create a closer collaboration between sustainability folks and those working on climate from the sustainability lens and their um, their peers and planning departments, as well as many other folks who are stakeholders in the in the transportation space. So, you kind of mentioned it. So, what was specifically this peer exchange about? That you could maybe add a little bit more to your explanation there. Sure. So, so uh, there's a little bit of a wonk alert here with the language, and I and I'm I'm going to ask for your forgiveness as we start on that. But the yeah. the concept is called the working at the at the nexus of the mitigation resilience and uh, the nexus of mitigation resilience and equity and so obviously there's a climate focus there and there's a there's a idea of trying to figure out where there's overlap and projects and policy around those three ideas um, i think 
probably a simpler way to describe it is to recognize that we have so much work to do when it comes to climate change um, that comes in a in several different buckets. One is that we have to be people first focused. So we have to respond to the immediate needs of our community and recognize that that's going to be the mm -hmm. thing that's most important to drive projects forward. Two, we have to think about how we're going to address the impacts of climate change. And three, we've got to do something about you know, continuing to contribute to the problem, which I think is probably the area we're all most familiar with as energy policy folks. Uh, you, you, no exception to that, right, Mitch? Right, exactly. So what, what were your results? I mean, give us some of the insights that uh, you guys came up with. So, so the results were interesting. You know, like I said, there was a baseline setting and there's some, there's some uncomfortable conversations when you talk about equity because one of the components of equity is racial equity. And it really requires us to reflect on our privilege in some cases. You know, here I am, I'm a white male and, and you know, societal rules have given me advantage historically and given me privilege that, that I need to be aware of and recognize where there may be others in our community that don't get the same access to resources. Um, we talked also about income equity and, and, and many other issues and kind of just laid those things out really plainly and said, hey, this, it's important to start with a recognition that people have different different limitations imposed on them and that and that any kind of project or policy design should at least try to recognize those things. Um, and then again, this idea of um, getting together as peers and practicing, you know, how do we reorient our typical project approach from one, you know, as energy sector folks where we're thinking specifically about, okay, what we want is for everyone in the state of Hawaii to drive an electric vehicle. And so we are going to give tax credits to everyone who buys one and we're going to roll it out like this and here's how much money there is in total and our hope is to achieve x number of vehicles that is certainly a useful approach for a universal goal but the thing that it misses and the thing the kind of things we focused on in the peer exchange is to say hey wait a minute that's a that's a that's a great goal and universal goals are really important in the context of climate and other societal goals but is there a way that we could start that process where instead of just kind of giving everyone equal access to the resources, we could really say who could benefit most initially. And then over time, we can try to help everyone move in that direction, but start with the folks who can who can benefit most and, and really ask, what do they need? You know, do they need a tax credit? Do they need more information? Do they need access to charging? You know, what what are the true barriers? And then construct the policy or the project in, from that from that framework, that perspective. So um, I'm kind of curious, how did, how did you actually find people or participants that cover the various ranges of social equity and competing interests? How, how did you manage to do that? Because in the policy so, forum, we're all privileged. You know, we all have great jobs yes. and we do, you know, we're higher income yes. people. So how, do, how did you yes. actually attract uh, the right kind of mix and people to make sure that we get the right inputs? So I'm not sure that we did a comprehensive job of that. I, you know, I think candidly, what we did is we looked within the forum and we looked at our members and said, who can, who can benefit from learning and working on this policy? And then we also brought in some experts from outside who are very familiar with this work and work across cities throughout the country. Um, you know, one of the things that we all acknowledged in the peer exchange is that the, one of the critical components of this work is actually being on the ground and working in your community and finding out what the specific needs are of, of, of that given community, whether it be a neighborhood, uh, a particular ethnic or, or racial group in your, in your community, or, or anyone else, someone, you know, people that are disadvantaged in one way or the other, and then and kind of asking directly, you know, what is it that we can do, you know, framing it from the context of, context of this is what we're trying to achieve, what, what are some options and ways to move forward that would be most beneficial to a given community? So I definitely wanna acknowledge what I think is your point, Mitch, in that you know, this requires much more community engagement and, and this peer exchange was not intended to reflect that, that community engagement, but more to, to talk about the process and how you would go about doing that. Okay. So we've uh, seen some examples of our, uh, you know, the legislature was trying to do good and they put in the GEMS program, which was to provide uh, low income and people with the opportunity to have uh, PV panels on their houses. But it's taken forever mm -hmm. for them to actually walk this program out. And one of the big, my understanding, one of the big uh, roadblocks or speed bumps is just like, hey, low income people don't have great credit and they may not qualify for it. So like, so here we got these hundred, you know, 
tens of millions of dollars sitting in the bank. We're paying interest on it. And for some reason, we can't come up with some solution to allow the people that really need it to get it. So. So I don't know when the last time you spoke to Gwen Yamamoto Lau was from from Hawaii Green Infrastructure Authority, but yeah. I spoke to Gwen a couple of months ago. And, and from my understanding, you're right, it took a long time. And obviously, she was not involved in the early days of that program. But again, from my understanding, that program is now up and running successfully. And they are, you know, de-risking the, the projects fairly well. So I think it's, you know, I think it is, that's a great example of a, of a, solution to equity barriers and specifically to you know income equity barriers where people don't have access to capital because of credit or because of other reasons and you're allowed to you know you're you're in a position where you can finance through your bill and it's not attached to the property so it solves a lot of problems as you know right. i mean you know as a renter it's it's you can't make a 20 or 30 thousand dollar investment on your roof but but through on bill financing you actually can okay well that's great that we can do that so what are the kind of problems did you identify and any potential solutions out there? So we, we definitely talked about some other example challenges, which I think a lot of us are very familiar with, but, uh, but useful to reflect on. You know, certainly um, the solar tax credits, both at a local and a, and a federal level, run into some of the same equity barriers, right? You need to have the money to start with in order to make that investment, and then you get it back in, in the form of a tax credit. So what are what are ways to overcome that? Um, but but I would say more than anything, what we did is we, we had kind of a, we broke up into a couple different groups and we just were in small enough groups. There was about 20 plus people involved in the peer exchange. So with, with groups of 10 people, worked through a process where we inverted our normal thinking um, in terms of starting with what I'll say mitigation, but really what I mean is starting with clean energy solutions and then and then also and then thinking, okay, how can they also be resilient? How can they also be equitable? And then and we started on the other end of the spectrum. So what what does it mean to start with an equitable solution? You know, what do people need in the transportation space? So if if our if our universal goal is again try to electrify um, a large portion of the vehicle fleet in Hawaii, what do people need? And the conversation became one of, well, people certainly need access to charging. In many cases, those are renters. In many cases, those are people that live in multi-unit dwellings. So looking at incentives that address that. And I certainly we've seen some conversation around that, but I'm not familiar with any policy that has successfully, that yet, you know, as, as yet successfully targeted that specific market. And maybe we'll see something this session. Um, we talked about, you know, the, the broader needs, like some people just can't afford to own a car plain, you know, straight up. So what does electrification mean to them? And maybe it means electrifying transit and giving, you know, as we roll out transit, maybe the first people to benefit from these clean, comfortable buses are those who are starting from a dis disadvantaged place, whether it be a hydrogen bus or an electric a battery electric bus, you know, right. either way, they're a lot, maybe a lot more enjoyable to drive and a lot more enjoyable to have in your community because they're quieter and they're less polluting. So put those in the communities that have historically been disadvantaged first. Right. Um, one other example that we talked about was kind of last mile solutions and, and certainly things like car sharing come up mm -hmm. and, and you know working with car share companies so that they're not just plunk, plunking their cars down in the most lucrative markets, because obviously any given local jurisdiction has some control over how that is managed and rolled out. So, so leaning into those companies a little bit and saying, we wanna make sure you, you, you provide an, an equitable um, service arrangement and make sure that those who could really benefit from the, these services the most have access and have the ability to use the system, whether that means, you know, I don't have a credit card, but there's some other system to access it or something else. Right. So there, I thought there was a really a lot of good discussions about how to approach that. It is just scratching the surface and it's like a change in practice for some of us. You know, some some people in the room certainly had more experience than others. Um, I will say for me, this is I'm a novice, I'm learning and I'm trying to figure out how to how to move it forward, but very excited. Okay, hey, well, uh, that's really great, Ben. Uh, we're going to have a little quick break. Give me a chance to figure out some other questions to ask you and maybe uh, you can think of other subjects you want to cover. So we'll be back in about a minute Absolutely. and uh, aloha, everybody. Aloha, I'm Winston Welch, host of Out and About. It's a show that we have every other Monday on Think Tech Live here. We explore a variety of topics that are really interesting. We explore organizations, events, and the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. 
We've got some amazing guests on here, like all the shows at Think Tech. So if you want to catch up on stuff, tune into my show every other Monday and other shows here on Think Tech Live. It's a great place to learn about stuff, to be informed. And uh, if you have some ideas, come on my show. Let's talk about it. See you later and aloha. Hello, I'm Mufi Hanneman. I want to tell you about a great show that appears on Think Tech Hawaii. It's all about tourism. In fact, we call it Tourism 101, where we talk about the issues and challenges that faces our number one industry throughout the state. We'll have some interesting guests, some very informative dialogue, and allow you an opportunity to maybe learn a little bit more about why this industry is so important for our state. It's been great for us in the past. We need it today, and especially going forward. That's Tourism 101 on Think Tech Hawaii. Mahalo. Well, here we are, the second half of Hawaii, the state of uh, clean energy, and I am very pleased to have Ben Sullivan, the energy coordinator for the county of Kauai on board, and he's just completed the first round of how many rounds of a peer exchange uh, experiment initiated by Ben, actually, but as part of the Hawaii Energy uh, Policy Forum. So, Ben, uh, during the break, I came up with a couple of questions just to uh, um, um, keep us going here. So one is, uh, what, was, what was your impression of the level of enthusiasm among the, uh, the peers that you had out there in Kauai? So actually, we, we convened on Maui. Um, oh, OK. And I thought the enthusiasm was really good. I will tell you, um, as, as, as a part of my response, that we had two really amazing facilitators. So, so the folks who facilitated and led the discussion for us were um, Kristen Baja from the Urban Sustainability Directors Network and Lindsay X, who is the Climate Program Manager from the City of Fort Collins. And so wow. both of these people have been working actually across the country on this on the same concept with, I think, about a dozen cities nationwide. And really, and, and you know, they are the first to admit this is this is something that the Urban Sustainability Directors Network is exploring as kind of a shift in practice to to take a, a more people centered equity based approach. And so there's a lot of learning happening in both directions, but they had some, you know, they had some really great insights. And on in, in terms of enthusiasm, I think it always starts with who's in the front of the room. And they were both incredibly enthusiastic. Uh, Kristen Baja in particular was there to provide the keynote for HCPO on Friday as well. And so we took advantage of her presence in the state and and she really did a great job. Um, you know, that said, it's it's always a challenge, I think, for to ask busy professionals to spend a full day in the room. And so, you know, to be candid, I think there are some people who are kind of like, what is it? You know, what is it we're talking about? It's a little harder for me to figure out how to get into this because it's not as um, it's not as cut and dry and step A, B, C, D as a lot of the other things that we often work on in this space. Right. So how do you keep how do you think we're going to be able to keep that level of enthusiasm up? I mean, it's always great having a big meeting and everybody's all pumped up and then everybody goes away to their day job. And uh, the enthusiasm quickly ebbs. So how can we keep this alive? What's the concept behind that? That's a great question. So as you know, Mitch, um, you know, Sherilyn Wee has done a tremendous job with HEPF and really thinking about how we communicate as a network and how we can strengthen our organization through some, some tools. And so one of the tools that her and her team have put a lot of uh, work into is this online web platform that really allows more peer sharing. Um, that's a work in progress, and we'll see if that helps. Um, I think the concept of the peer exchange is also to build relationships. So it's we're not just getting in the room and wonking out on a policy and then leaving. We're actually spending a little social time, and we're connecting on an issue that we're passionate about. Certainly, that's something the forum has done in the past, so nothing new there, but, certain, but also an important part of the fabric of any network. Um, and then I think recognizing that we're not alone in doing this. You know, if you follow the um, the State Climate Commission and the work that Anu Hiddle is is uh, facilitating and organizing with that body, there's a lot of conversations about equity and putting you know putting equity in the front of our processes. Um, and certainly, I think that follows a trend nationwide. So, it's it's an important conversation. Um, certainly, there are lots of examples of where we haven't done that, and we touched on a few earlier, but there are many more. Um, and the question becomes, you know. What what are the examples of of successes that we can really that we can really begin to find ourselves in a place to to leverage? Um, one of the most exciting things for me as I think about 
putting people first and putting equity first, which maybe, you know, I, I hope, <laughs> I hope I don't sound like a fool and having that not have been obvious all along. But as you know, I, I think you can relate to the idea that as an like as an energy sector professional, so often we're thinking about the widget or the, or the again the universal goal that we can sometimes right. forget that. And so, getting in that mindset and then just really drilling down and and asking more questions of our community, what it is, what is it that's your barrier? You know, it, do you need chargers? Do you even have an interest in electric vehicles? I mean, EVs are a great example where there is certainly to some extent a stigma because you know you got this wonderful company in Tesla that came out with you know, $90,000 cars that everybody wanted to buy. And that's not exactly a solution that is right. open to everyone in Hawaii. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> um, right. But we had some interesting conversations about the used EV market and whether that was an opportunity to try to actually open up that. And yeah. is there a way that state and county could participate and do exactly that so that more affordable and reliable vehicles were available to residents of Hawaii as a deliberate strategy? Um, a lot of other great conversations. But uh, I, I, you know, I can't say enough. And and your point is really well taken. It's it's a always going to be a challenging thing to do. And and um, I don't think any one person can promise that we're going to continue to right. hammer. But we can do our best. So how do we expand the scope? Like, okay, so this is an experiment. You had like twenty people involved in this, and you got some initial. The initial results look good. But part of the uh, concept when uh, we first uh, when you first came up with this was to expand this network. And almost like have it go viral and uh, bring other mm -hmm. people in. I mean, there's lots of people, obviously, who are not part of the policy forum. They don't necessarily have the, uh, the, the passwords and all that kind of stuff. How do we actually get out to the, the general public and, and push these ideas out there and get their feedback? So uh, there's, a, there's a lot. I think there were several questions there. So let me try, yeah, to, were... try to back up. <laughs> Sorry. Um, how do we how do we expand the forum? So so that's an ongoing question for Sherilyn and the steering committee. And and I guess my input on that would be to say, um, I, I think that it's always going to be necessary to kind of define forum membership around the the broad housing of energy, but really to say, you know, what are the opportunities for us to interface more directly with folks in other sectors? Right. So we all know that the housing sector is a really critical sector in Hawaii and that housing is just a paramount issue for anyone dealing with policy, you know, beyond just the energy sector. So all our legislators, all our councils are thinking about housing and affordability. So what's the overlap? And there, you know, the over overlaps are obvious, but can we actually get in the room with folks who are working on housing and say, hey, we want to be a resource. We want to help. What is needed? Um, so there's an example of how to do that and not to necessarily say you're now members of the forum, but to say, let's build stronger bridges between housing and energy. Um, same thing, as you know, has been happening with the transportation sector. And that's been certainly challenging, but but uh, illuminating as well, where there's, you know, there's the Department of Transportation has been much more involved in the forum. A bunch of other planners, you know, whether they be from MPOs or from the federal government or just people working in, in, in bike and ped and transit have really contributed a lot of their expertise, understanding that there's a huge overlap with renewable energy and with um, energy policy as it relates to ground transportation. So I, I think it just, it's about continuing to seek out those solutions. Um, one of the things that came up was uh, the possibility of really trying to frame a package of legislation around equitable electrification. Mm -hmm. So acknowledging that one of the primary policies that the state is, is driving and the counties are very much investing in is electrification of the vehicle fleets. But then again, centering people first and, and centering on this conversation of equity. So it, which as you know, but I think is always important to make the distinction, equity is not equality, right? So we're not talking about everyone having an equal crack at things. We're actually talking about saying, correcting a historical disadvantage and giving, giving maybe more resources to those who have been disadvantaged um, through no fault of their own over, over the course of time. So what, you know, that, that's a fun conversation. I think a very fruitful conversation that could come out of um, a conversation about electrification. As you probably know, some of the reticence we've seen about major investments in electrification in the past have been about exactly that. You know, legislators and, and council members, I think, you know, from my perspective have said, we understand the big, the big picture, but how do we spend, how do we spend resources on what at this time and at this point in time appears to be a solution for those with with means as opposed to those without right. and so by responding with a package on equity you're really you're really trying at least to answer that question right 
So uh, did, is, are there any, were there any obvious uh, policy issues uh, that popped up out of this? I mean, I know you just covered it in, in your just conversation here, but is there any like uh, low-hanging fruit, I'll call it, that, that you discovered <laughs> that it's so obvious, why didn't we realize that, that we can uh, you know, put forward maybe this, even this legislative session? Um, well, that, certainly that was one that we just that we just touched on. Um, uh, you know, I'm, you're putting me on the spot here, so okay. apologies for not just being really quick to nail something else. I think actually electrification of transit and public transit in particular is is one that's already got some legs in the state, right. um, and you know has a lot of potential through the VW settlement funds, and certainly speaks to. Um, to, to equity if we do it in the right way. So, so not only are, you know, do we roll out electric buses, but where do we roll them out? Right. You know, who gets them first is an important question and how do they benefit from that? Um, other, other conversations really had to do with, you know, not, not getting completely hung up on, again, that universal goal, but kind of backing up a little bit and saying, you know, what is the barrier for a given community and how do we overcome that? You know, I mean, maybe, maybe the barrier barrier is just informational or just cultural, like, you know, right now, I think candidly, we can say that, you know, EVs, and this is not across the board, but EVs are more, you know, in the current paradigm, kind of a white environmental thing, right? And so how do we, how do we try to help shift that where, where everyone in the community across a diverse uh, group, you know, feels like, hey, this is actually a solution for me, you know, and that, and that, that comes in different forms. A lot of that is, is figuring out how to introduce these things in a way that makes sense for people, um, but certainly not easy work. Yeah, I see some uh, overlap uh, between your peer exchange group and the one that uh, Riley Sato uh, is uh, leading on, basically on public transit, public transportation. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. there could be some really interesting overlaps there. Because um, he's come up with some very interesting uh, legislation which passed last year public-private partnerships with the counties, and uh, it allows private companies to come in and buy all the vehicle fleets, and the county pays a, uh, you know, a user fee, but then you can focus those fleets, public transportation fleets, like you said, on the, uh, on the, on the lower-income neighborhoods where they really need this kind of transportation just to get to their job, you know, and they don't have to spend right. all their money on gasoline and car maintenance and all that other stuff, and make the bus right. really a superior system. So. It's their first choice. Oh, I'm going to take the bus. They only take their car or pickup truck if they're going to the beach on a Saturday and they, they're going to a particular, you know, just the convenience factor. But they're not having to drive their vehicles every day of the week. Yes, yes. And actually, you reminded me of one. So we all love the idea of, uh, of truck share. So as you know, Mitch, so many of us in Hawaii kind of feel the pull of, of having a pickup truck. But then when we reflect on that ownership, we realize that, you know, it's, it's, I only really need it once a month or once every two months, whether it's to go on a big surf trip or to go camping or to deal with a construction, yeah. a small renovation project at my house. Um, so the, so, you know, so trying to figure out, can we, can we stimulate, uh, you know, the implementation of truck share and the tools are there. Right. It's just a matter of kind of catching up and getting, you know, finding the market in the right, in the right place to do it. But Great that idea. allows people to say, hey, yeah, maybe we could be a one car family. Maybe we could rely more on transit. And then when we need a truck or when we need another vehicle, we just pick it up as a shared shared use vehicle or or we rely on other resources. You know, electric bikes are another one that the county of Kauai is very interested in, as an example. Um, certainly, you know, as you know well, Oahu has had a smashing success with, with bike share. And I, um, I'm not as familiar, but I do think that that program has really tried to pay attention to where they're plunking those yeah, stations does. down and right right yeah. so and then i gotta wrap what about, up what about hydrogen <laughs> yeah we're gonna do that on another show we've all already right, burned right. through our whole half hour and i'm getting all sorts of flashing <laughs> lights to wrap up so ben thank you so much for uh, coming on the show and it was really interesting and i'm really pleased to see the initial results of this are looking pretty good so uh, that's something we all talk, talk about the next time we have a steering committee meeting or our general membership meeting. So thank you. And hey, one last thing. Oh, one last one. Thanks okay. to our sponsors. Sponsors, Hawaii Energy and Ulupono really stepped up to the plate and helped finance this thing, make it happen. Really important to acknowledge them. Awesome. And HNEI. <laughs> and the there you yeah. go. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank well, you, sir. We're gone. Aloha. Thank you so much, Ben.